Hey everyone and welcome to Editing and Printing Landscape Photography with Adobe Lightroom 5. I'll be your host today, my name is Joe Brady and we're gonna have a lot of fun with this today. So our goal today, we're gonna edit some landscape photographs to bring out the full color and tonality the way we remember seeing the scene with our own eyes. We're gonna remove some distractions, some dust, some unnecessary elements. Our goal is to produce great landscape prints with consistent color, tonality, and impact. And this is going to include choosing a paper surface and having a custom paper profile for your printer. You might have noticed I've got these kind of black prints behind me. Now those are going to be our final results and you'll see that at the end of the program. Let's talk a little bit about paper profiles before we do get into software. Now, paper profile is a description of how your paper and your printer combination can put down color on the paper. What is its gamut? How much range do you have? What's its tonality? You can get good results with factory supplied profiles. However, custom profiles will give you the most capability your paper has to offer, particularly if you're dealing with fine art papers, which is what I really like to do. Now, what I did was I created a custom paper profile for Ilford's gold cotton textured paper, my favorite paper, for my Canon 6350. Now this is a fine art paper. It's got a nice tooth to it. It's kind of like a watercolor paper with a very fine grain to it. And in the past, papers like that were kind of dull. They had a really nice surface, but there just wasn't enough pop to the image. Well, that has changed. Now I'm not going to go through the process today, but this is actually just one of the test charts from the Color Monkey photo that I printed out on the Canon. And I don't know how well it translates on the video, but these colors are intense. And that's just the beauty of these papers. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little more later. Now, I have spoken about creating custom paper profiles in the past. And I'm not going to go into details of that today. But when we send our follow-up email, we'll supply some links to those previous programs. Now, I have found that the factory supplied profiles for like the glossy and luster stocks are often pretty accurate. The fine art papers, however, benefit greatly from a custom profile, which is why I went through the exercise of creating a profile for that particular paper on my printer. So let's talk about the editing process. Well, why do we have to do any editing first place if we capture the image right? Well, you have to understand, you gotta keep reminding yourself, that your camera doesn't record light and tone the way your eyes do. As you look around, your eyes constantly re-meter, they adjust for color, they adjust for tone, they adjust for white balance. Your camera can't do that, it can only pick one. What the editing process allows you to do is to shape the light and color in the scene so that you can make a photograph that better represents the feeling of the place that inspired you to capture the image in the first place. So to make all this happen, what are the steps you need to take? First of all, you've got to profile your monitor, really essential. Next, download or create a paper profile for your paper of choice. Then we'll go through edits and enhancements on the image. We'll take a look at soft proofing to see if the paper requires any tweaks to make it the print even better. And then remember to take care of your print, mounting, framing, or coating, and then you can just enjoy your print. So starting with monitor calibration, I'm not going to go over monitor calibration today, but this is a critical first step. If you're going to use factory paper profiles, then I can recommend two pieces, both the Color Monkey Display and the i1 Display Pro. Now these devices both do a great job. They're very easy to use. They perform similar functions, the main difference being their software capabilities. If you want simple to use yet powerful, I'd recommend the Color Monkey Display, the one you see on the left here. If you like lots of data and you want to keep track of how your monitor is doing over time, then take a closer look at the i1 Display Pro on the right. Now there are, pro there are programs that are archived, as I mentioned, that go over each of these systems in detail. We'll give you a link when we do that follow-up email. Now if you want the ability to create your own paper profiles, then the Color Monkey Photo and the i1 Pro 2 are the devices for you. Now if you like to print on fine art papers, the profiles that these devices create provide a much better match to your printer's capabilities and are going to give you the best color that your printer paper combination can give to you. Now for me this extra step is extremely important and makes my prints on my favorite paper. Again, I actually have a box of it right here. This is the Ilford Gold Cotton Textured. And this is my favorite paper. This is a spectacular looking paper that gives me results that it just makes me smile. 
So assuming your monitor is profiled, let's go ahead and get in the editing process. Now one of the first things I like to do is to have a custom camera profile available for my landscape photography. Even though color and tone in these types of images can be somewhat subjective, having an accurate starting point to your color and your tonal range are perfect makes the editing process much easier. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into Lightroom, we're going to create and apply a custom camera profile using X-Rite's Color Checker Passport. Take a look. Let's create a custom camera profile for our camera and if you're out in the field and you're doing some landscape work, well you can simply hold the thing out and you can see a picture of me just holding the passport out in front of me. Uh, the one important thing is you do need to make sure you've got a good exposure. You can't have anything clipping and as we can see from this particular shot, if I click on the shadow clipping and then in the upper right click on the highlight clipping, I see nothing shows up, there's no alerts, so that means we have a good exposure and we're going to be able to create a profile. Now, profile is very easy to create. Let's just simply go up to File, Export with Preset, Color Checker Passport. Now, profiles are peculiar to a camera, so it's only going to work with the camera that was actually used to shoot this particular shot. So I'll call this, uh, I'll call it Sony A99 Demo, and save. And that's how difficult it is to create a custom camera profile. It's really that simple. Now understand that white balance and profile do go together. Uh, if you are dealing with an image, you want to run a white balance. If you didn't do it in camera, then you can use the passport as a reference and you can really pick any of these gray patches. They're all going to be a neutral. Understand that a profile takes the, works with the white balance and what it does is it has references for, well, take a look, red, green, blue, CMYK, and then a couple of rows of colors that are kind of naturally occurring. And since each camera now has a standard, it has a standard reference as to what red, green, and blue are in CMYK, it knows where to place those colors within that white balance. So everything snaps right into place. So if you've got an artificial light source that's got maybe spikes or dips in it, it's going to correct for that. Uh, same thing if you're out in the environment. The standard Adobe profile sometimes causes you to lose a little bit of saturation in particular colors, particularly in blues I find. What this does is it snaps everything back into place. Now landscape photography is somewhat subjective as far as colors go, uh, but at least having a great starting point is going to give you the best color spot to start from. So we can see the profile has been generated and it says Lightroom has to be restarted to activate the profile. So we just click OK, we'll go ahead and restart Lightroom and we're ready to use our profile. I've restarted Lightroom and now our profile is going to be there ready for us to apply. Let's first take a look and see what effect the profile actually has on the shot of the color checker. And what I'll ask you to take a look at in particular uh, this is this diagonal row of blues and this purple here and if you look real close this brown as well. Profile application is found underneath camera calibration and you see we have the Adobe standard and that's what you're always going to be given. Let's click on here and apply our Sony Alpha 99 demo that we just created. As I click on this, take a close look at this particular diagonal row of blues and this purple and watch what happens to them. You're going to see them snap in. Did you see that? Notice how much deeper these colors have gotten. Everything else has been left alone. It's been saying that the Adobe standard was fine at defining these other colors, but these colors had lost some depth. One more time, let's just flip it back to the standard, and you see they lose some saturation. Apply our demo, and you can see these blues, this purple, and actually this kind of uh, cyan over here all snap into place. So let's see what effect this has in an actual landscape shot. So let's come over to here. This is a shot actually in Monument Valley. This is a, a kind of a semi-cave uh, that the, the Navajo see as an eagle. In fact, you can kind of see uh, here's a, kind of the beak and there's the eye and the, actually the wing comes down lower. In fact, here's a, a shot of the entire cavern. It's a very cool place. So let's see what effect having the profile applied to this image does. Yes, the color is going to be somewhat subjective, but having a custom profile is going to give us the best starting point. So if I click on Profile and go once more to our Sony A99 demo, watch in particular both the sky and the sandstone are both going to change color. And you see how everything snaps? 
Now the image has got a lot more pop. It's cut more the way that I remembered it when I shot the image. And now if I want to do edits, I'm doing it from a very sound and great starting point for my color. So did you guys notice how the color of the sky just popped when the profile was applied? I do a lot of photography out west, and the depth of the blue sky is so much more intense than back here in the east. Having a profile for this environment brings back the full saturation and intensity of those western skies. Now, before we continue, a couple questions that have come through. And again, if you joined us late, join in the chat room. We'll be taking some of your questions live and keep it, thing, keep it fun. So first of all, someone asked, how do you uh, apply develop presets to a group of selected images? Uh, it's using the sync command. You're gonna, we're going to go into Lightroom and see more of that. Again, if I don't get into detailed answers to some of the questions you have, we will give you an email address in, later on and in our follow-up so you can get me a question that way. Uh, someone asked, can the Color Monkey be used on a MacBook Pro? And I've got right here, I've got the Color Monkey Photo. I've got a Color Monkey Display and an i1 Display Pro. I've got my MacBook Pro here, and yes, I've used all three of them on it. Works great. Uh, should I reprofile each batch of paper I purchase? The answer to that is no, there's no need. You do need to have a profile for each paper type. But if you buy, say, you buy a roll or a box of, of uh, the gold cotton textured, do you need to reprofile when you buy another roll or box? No, the, the surface isn't going to change. Only when something really changes to the name of the paper, meaning maybe they reformulated the coatings. But other than that, no. Once you create a paper profile for your printer and paper, you're good to go. Uh, someone asked, has Color Monkey Display or the i1 Display Pro resolved any compatibility issues with Mavericks OS X? And the answer to that is yes. I did upgrade my MacBook Pro to Mavericks, which for those of you not familiar with it, that's the new Mac OS 10.9. There were some issues. If you go on to xrightphoto.com, uh, there is a notice there. If you go to the product under the support tab, you'll see there's a uh, XRD file, I believe is what it's called. You'll see it's got an update and it, it loads in a couple of uh, updates into the software to make everything work smoothly with the new Mavericks operating system. And it does work fine. Once I did that, I haven't had any troubles with it all. Uh, last question, somebody said, what white balance should you set on your camera when you shoot the color checker? Uh, good question. Uh, understand that when you shoot the color checker, you have to be shooting a raw file. And technically, a raw file doesn't have a white balance in it. It's just the raw data. Now, it's going to take whatever raw balance was in or white balance was in your camera and use it as a default setting. But it, in essence, it really doesn't matter. Because what happens is when the software goes in and it creates the profile using the color checker, the software knows at first it's able to find where the color checker is. And after it does that, it knows which of those patches should be neutral. And it internally, behind the scenes, does its own white balancing. So you don't have to white balance first. You don't even have to have a correct white balance set on your camera. It's just a benefit to you if you have one that's kind of close. So if it's daylight, shoot daylight. If it's cloudy, shoot cloudy. But in reality, it doesn't matter as far as profile cr uh, creation is concerned. Again, the custom camera profile doesn't only adjust the colors. It adjusts the tonal curve as well. It does use all of those patches, and it knows what the values are, so it has a light to dark reference as well. And you might not think about it, it might not be obvious, but this has a benefit to both color and black and white images. So now it's time to explore some of the details of the editing process. We're going to go into Lightroom and take a look at a workflow that will cover most of the basics. And then after that, we'll come back and take some more questions before we go into the advanced editing functions. So let's jump into Lightroom and see the basic editing process. Let's get started with our imaging uh, editing workflow. And what I like to do is start with the histogram. However, first, I'm going to get rid of some stuff I don't need. Uh, just to give myself a little bit more screen area to play with. Now, I've got my zoom set for one to three. Let me change that to one to two, just so I can zoom in and see what's going on a little better. I can toggle that on and off with the zoom key. And then I'm going to hide this entire panel over on the left to give me some more room to play with my image. Now, generally what I like to do is start globally first, then deal with spots and distractions, and then go to local kind of edits. And to do that first, I'm going to start with the histogram. First of all, let's take a look at it. What exactly is it telling us? In fact, I'm going to give that a little bit more room. 
Well, we can see here that this exposure really is actually very good. Uh, there's no really completely deep blacks. There's no danger of, of white clipping here. In fact, if we turn on the clipping buttons, shadow clipping and highlight clipping, we can see nothing happens, which means the image is perfectly exposed, but it needs some oomph. Because again, the way that I saw this image when I was here was it had a lot more color to it, so the colors are more subdued, and I really want to bring out the feeling of the place. Also, when I mentioned about local dis and distractions and uh, uh, spots, you can see we've got a little tripod leg here from one of the photographers I was with, so definitely going to want to get rid of that. In fact, that's bugging me, so let's get rid of that first. And one of the cool things in Lightroom 5 is that the spot removal tool up here now it works a little differently. I'm going to make it a little bit smaller using the left bracket key. And let me go ahead and zoom in on this bottom left hand corner. And we can see that there's some pure black in the tripod leg and we don't care about that. So I'm going to make the spot removal to a little smaller. And in the past you would just have the ability to click and then it would go find a place to sample from. Well what I'm going to do is instead make it a little smaller and I'm going to click and drag because now you can actually paint with the spot removal tool. And there are two options over here on the spot edit. You can see a clone and a heel. And what they do is, well, clone just takes the sample area that it's sampling from and literally copies and pastes it. Heel uses the underlying textures uh, to maintain how it, the image looked. Now what you can do also is while you're here, you can change the area that you're healing from so that it more mirrors the area that you're healing. So I'm just going to drag this up until I get those things lined up. Then I'll hit done and we got really we got rid of that leg. Pretty good. So let's continue on. So I'm going to hit the Z key to unzoom and that's all gone. We're going to come back to some of these tools for more local edits in a little bit. But let's start with the basics. By the way, one other thing while I'm in here you might notice if I hit have basic selected and then I come down and say oh I'm going to go to use saturation luminance as I open this the basic tab closes and this is an option in the Lightroom workflow and what you need to do is hold down the control key or on a PC uh, right click and you do it in this area in the gray area to the left of the heading titles and you get these options and one of them is called solo mode and what solo mode does is when you open up one tab it closes all the others so there's only one open and that just keeps you from having to scroll up and down a lot another thing there's a couple of tabs that I personally rarely if ever use and that's the tone curve and split toning uh, so you can see here you can turn them on and off by having these checks split toning I hardly ever do in Lightroom so I leave it turned off uh, so if you find yourself not using some of these things let's say you never use effects or lens corrections which you're going to uh, but you can turn them on and off right here and this is available by the way this option is available on both sides so if you never use collections for example you could also turn it off again control or right click in the gray area to the side of the title alright so let's go back to our basic tab now we've already decided that our histogram is great so that's telling us that well, we've got no highlight or shadow clipping warnings the distribution of the data here matches the images we've got some dark areas we've got some really light areas but everything's in there so what do we need to do to add some oomph or some impact back to this image well again the highlights are fine we don't need to do anything so for this particular image we're gonna skip this entire area uh, which is kind of self-explanatory highlights would actually increase the highlights if I wanted to make them brighter shadows will open up shadows which we may come back to because some of the other sliders will have an effect on that uh, blacks and, and whites are self-explanatory again what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go into clarity and I'm gonna bring this up quite a bit because a lot of landscape images really benefit from a lot of clarity and what clarity is it's kind of a local contrast it looks at localized areas and increases the contrast in uh, high contrast borders vibrance is for muted colors less saturated colors and particularly blues and greens so if I bring the vibrance slider up and down you can see it mostly affects the blue sky however we're gonna take one little quick detour before we continue I'm gonna go down to camera calibration because I want to load in the custom camera profile 
for this particular camera. Now this is my Sony Alpha 99 and the Adobe standard uh, as we've seen in the past it does have a tendency to cause a loss of certain colors particularly blues. So if I click on there and go to my Sony Alpha 99 full sun profile take a look at the sky when I go ahead and apply this profile and you can see not only the sky but the tonal distribution and some of these warmer colors in here are changing. Let me go back to that just so you can see. So here's the standard. So the sky is obviously getting color back and also some of the orange and beige here as well. So let's go ahead and apply that one more time. And good. This puts us in a much better starting point. We've got a much more accurate color distribution for this particular camera because this is a custom profile. So let's go back to basics. So now we'll go ahead and add a little bit more vibrance add a little bit more intensity to the blue and I also want to bring up the vibrance of the arch in front of us so I'm going to do that by increasing the saturation now to my eyes when we were here the underside of this arch here was positively glowing orange that's one of the things that attracted me to take the image in the first place and I want to bring this up a little bit more so to do that what I'm going to do is go to hue saturation and luminance and this is one of my favorite tabs and it's you also the reason that I rarely use the tone curve anymore because I find myself getting my contrast for color and saturation here a little bit better and what you want to do is first of all I want to increase the saturation and I'm going to use this this is the targeted adjustment tool I click on here I've got saturation chosen and I want to increase the saturation of just this color so all I need to do is click in it if I push up it increases the saturation if I drag down it takes out the saturation of that color and you can see it happening there so I'm gonna go ahead and add some saturation just to the orange the beauty of this is you can drag these sliders but if you're not sure exactly what all the component colors are of what you're working with you can go ahead and just click and drag the other thing is I want to increase the luminance I'm gonna increase the brightness of this orange a bit so I'm gonna click there again and I'm gonna increase the orange there and looking better it's got a lot more definition to it so what's next one other thing I want to do uh, to help me focus in on the image is there's too much of this curve of the arch here in the image it's too much of a heavy weight it's distracting from the curve so before I go any further I am going to click on the crop tool and go ahead and crop that now I can go to a preset actually to my eye I kind of see this as a square image so let me go one to one here and drag the image off and nope one to one doesn't quite work let's see what an 8 by 10 looks like and 8 by 10 except I'm going to drag the corner because I want it to go a horizontal 8 by 10 and that's looking more appropriate so if I get there I've minimized this uh, uh, mass of the right side of the arch and yeah I find that focuses the image a lot better plus it's now in a preset size so it'll sit nicely in a frame so we've dealt with saturation and luminance let's move along now since I went ahead and left open the tone curve let's take a look at it uh, tone curve also has a targeted adjustment tool if you're not comfortable with clicking in curves and going ahead and, and making uh, your own curve adjustments you can also do it right here so if I again click on the tool and decide well I want this area to be a little darker you can see as I move the cursor around it follows along the line on the curve I come into the middle here and the highlights you can see as that dot moves so I'm just gonna click in here I want to make this a little bit darker add a little more drama to the image I also want to make this a little darker this little part of the highlight but that's really not helping the way I want so we're gonna fix that in a little bit so let's be done with the tone curve and by the way you also have this little button here which will turn on and off the entire effect of that tab so you can see what it is you've just done to the image so let's move on we're going to save detail for last let's go to lens corrections now this is a fairly wide angle lens in fact let me bring up the information and you can see this was shot with a 15 millimeter f 2.8 fisheye lens in this case from Sigma and love the lens phenomenal point of view it gives you however most super wide lenses do have a little bit of chromatic aberrations going on just the nature of the beast so let's go ahead and see if we can find those and to do that I'm gonna zoom in on the edge of the arch here in fact I'm really hardly seeing it zoomed in at one to th 
1 to 2, let's go at 1 to 1 and pick up an area of the arch. And we can see a little bit. You can see a very little bit along the edge there. So what I'm going to do is click on Remove Chromatic Aberration. And you might notice there's a little bit of green along the edge, and it just kind of disappeared right there. And I'm going to boost it up. I'm going to add both purple and green chromatic aberration removal. And now you can see that image is really cleaned up. In fact, let's go to 2 to 1. We're actually beyond the resolution of the image at this point. But let's go ahead and turn that on and off. And now you'll see, you can see the little green appearing there. Turn that on, and it's all gone. And that will really help to keep that image nice and clean. So let's move on from lens corrections. Now effects. This is something I generally do last, but I do like for preparing a print to add a little bit of post-crop vignetting. Very subtle amount. I want to darken the edges just a smidge. And I find myself going usually minus 7 or minus 8. And if I go there, it's a very subtle bit of vignetting. In fact, if you stare at the image right now, you really can barely see it. However, if I turn it on and off, then you get to see. And what it has the effect of doing is kind of refocusing you into the middle of the image so that you have uh, kind of your eye is more directed. The, the darkness on the edges keeps you in the image. So that's pretty much all of the basic edits. And we can take a look at this before and after. In fact, I'll get rid of the, the light so you can see. So the one on the left is where we started, and the one on the right, after just our quick basic edits, is where we are. A much better image, much more color, much more impact to it, much more pleasing scene. Next will be to come in and get some more of the local edits to really make it pop. Alrighty, I've got a lot of questions here about the Color Checker Passport. I'm going to address as many as I can. I didn't want to make this a passport webinar, but it is an important set of questions. So let's go, let's get as many taken care of as we can. First of all, do you need to create a profile every time you're in a different light for cloudy versus sunny versus etc.? Uh, not a bad idea. If you just create one for daylight, it will get you very close in pretty much any lighting situation except for mixed lighting. Uh, but uh, for me, I can tell you what I do. I have one for daylight. I have one for cloudy. I have one for my studio strobes, my uh, speed light flashes. And anytime I'm in some kind of mixed lighting, if I'm under fluorescent lights or a combination of fluorescent and tungsten, then I'll create a profile. Beyond that, what is going to change is not the, the spectrum. Because the, what a color checker passport does is it fixes dips or spikes in the spectrum of light. So if you're in a certain lighting situation, where say it's missing blue or it's got too much green, the passport will fix that. But what also changes through the course of the day is your white balance. And that's something that you're going to have to check all the time. The white balance and the profile work together. Let's see, what else? So someone asked, should you take a color, a, a photo of the chart in the shade or sun? Well, both. Take one in the shade and in the sun and create a profile for each of those. Uh, someone asked, does uh, photographing with a filter, like a, like a neutral density, uh, affect results? It can. Uh, I did a test. I have recently did some shoots with a 10-stop neutral density filter. And I did do a profile with that filter on to see how much of a change there was versus not having it on. The reason that that might change is, depending on the quality of the filter, it might not let even amounts of red, green, and blue get through the filter. In my case, when I did the test, it was a very, very, very small difference. But it might change. Now, if you've got a graduated neutral density, that's more difficult because you'd really need to have the entire lens covered in with that. But I did find it was pretty small change, so you're probably not going to have to do that. Uh, someone asked, how do you control light, room, or control light in your room uh, so that if, you're, if you knew you need to cover your window or your ambient light? If you've got a problem uh, when working, uh, I'd re highly recommend getting a hood for your monitor if you don't already have one. Make sure your monitor doesn't have a window shining on it, have the window behind it, and have a hood around it. Now, when you're doing profiling, it doesn't matter because any device you use, like the Color Monkey Photo here, is going to lie flush up against the screen. So it doesn't care what the ambient light is. None of it's getting through to the internal sensor. Uh, someone asked about the newer Thunderbolt displays. The new Apple displays are really nice. There's one very strong weakness, though, for what we're doing. They're still only sRGB color space displays. So 
yes, they're great for the internet, and that seems to be Apple's reason for doing that. But if you're in serious photography, serious printing, you're going to want a display that's going to show you the, at least the Adobe RGB color space. That's going to mean an ASO, a high-end NEC, uh, some of the HP monitors, some of the Dells. Look on the specs. Make sure they are Adobe RGB displays. Uh, someone asked if I use the ProPhoto color space, and do I also use that in Photoshop? Well, in Lightroom, you don't have a choice of color space while you're working. It's actually always in ProPhoto, or actually a slight variation of ProPhoto in Lightroom behind the scenes. In Lightroom, you actually assign the profile when you export, depending on where you're going to go. But to that point, I do often go back and forth between Lightroom and Photoshop. So yes, my Photoshop is set to use ProPhoto RGB as my default space. Uh, generally, what I do is all my work is done in ProPhoto. And then if I'm sending out to a lab, then it gets converted to sRGB. Uh, someone asked, they have both the Color Monkey and the i1 Pro. Lucky you. Uh, when it comes to paper profiling, is there any distinct advantage of one over the other? Uh, and they're a Mac user. Well, for the monitor profiling, really not much of a difference. I've tried them both and compared them, couldn't see anything. Paper profiling, though, the i1 Pro does take you up a notch. You have the ability to add many, many more patches, and that's going to create smoother gradations and squeeze a little bit more gamut out of the print. The Color Monkey, don't get me wrong, does phenomenal custom paper profiles. But if you're printing really big prints and you have very fine gradations over bigger areas, then the profile you get out of the i1 Pro 2 is going to be a little bit better and make those kinds of things smoother. All right, let's continue on. We've gone through all the basic functions, sort of the global ones. But Lightroom has a lot of things you can do on a more local level. So what we're going to do is go back into Lightroom and let's take a look at some of the more advanced edits that you can do. Let's do a series of local edits on this image, and then I'm going to bring up another image that's going to need a little bit more help as far as the exposure, highlights, shadows, etc. panel, as well as some more local adjustments. So as I mentioned when I saw this particular arch, and by the way, this is called the Wilson's Arch, it's near Moab, Utah, that this orange was glowing a bit more than I was seeing here in the image. And also, even though this is very bright in here, and it probably was, I want to bring it down a little bit because your eye has a tendency to go to the brightest thing, and I want to take away a little of that bright locally. So what I'm going to use to do that is the paintbrush right here. And I'm going to click on the adjustment brush. And when you do this, there's a couple of options that you need to be aware of. If it's not turned on, in this case, I want to use auto mask. What that's going to allow me to do is to paint close to an edge and it will ignore things that are a different color. Also, I want to show the mask overlay. This allows me to see where actually I have painted, or in essence, I haven't painted yet. What I'm doing is selecting. Now, I'm going to give myself a little bigger brush. I'm just going to hit the right bracket a couple of times. And now, with the show selected mask overlay, as I paint, you can see it shows up in red the areas that are being painted. And I can come right up to the edge and notice that it ignores the blue sky there. So I can toggle this mask overlay on and off by just tapping on the O key. And there it's hidden, but you can see I've still got the active button. And then I have the complete set of sliders like we normally have. So what I'm going to do is increase the saturation a lot just for this orange. And I can decide I want to add some more contrast to the local area. You see it adds a little more pop to it. And I can add clarity locally just to that. If I decide I want to change the color temperature, maybe even warm it up a little more, I can move over to the yellow. And that does a nice job of adding a lot of pop to this orange. However, now it's not quite fitting in with this foreground. So I'm going to click on New, and I'm going to hit the O key again to toggle on the mask overlay. And in this case, I'm going to paint on this light area here. Because what I want to do is just bring down the overall brightness or exposure of these little bits. And you can see it's very selective. I can come right into this area right next to the sky and it ignores the sky as long as that auto mask is chosen. So let's go ahead and toggle off the mask again. And in this case I'm going to bring the exposure down. Not a huge amount, just enough to take a little bit of the uh, oh the brightness sting out of it. I'm also going to decrease the contrast in this case. But I will add some clarity to refine some of the little shadows that are in there. And that's looking a lot better. Next, sharpening. So let's go to detail. 
and that's where sharpening can be found. And let's pick an area that we're interested in so we can really see what's going on. And to show this one-to-one -one preview, what I can do is click on this little tool here and come over to an area that I want to see the sharpening take effect. And I just click on there and it will stay in that area. So let's apply our sharpening. Now the default is 25. I'm going to go, I'm going to about double that go up to 75 or so and you can see when you do that it does add definition it also adds a little bit of grain to it and I don't want the sharpening to happen everywhere I only want it to happen on these fine details I certainly don't want to sharpen the sky that's just going to add noise do that let's just take a look at the other slider so the amount well straightforward the radius I generally stay at one or less I'll often come down to about seven tenths of a pixel for my radius Detail is how much of the detail do you want to preserve or how much do you want to ignore. Generally with something like this you want to increase the detail. Again, however, I don't want sharpening applied everywhere and that's where masking comes in. Unfortunately, when you drag the masking slider you don't get a lot of indication what's going on and sometimes you can't tell what's happening. However, hold down the Alt or Option key, that magic secret button in all things Adobe, and everything turns white. Now as you drag the masking slider off to the right and the big image will catch up, you get to see the actual areas that get sharpened and it's only the places in white. And I want those fine details and those fine borders to get the sharpening, not the big solid areas of color. So by doing that, let me go ahead and zoom in, one to one. So as we toggle sharpening on and off, you get to see how much of an effect there's off there's on and it makes a nice bit of sharpening for this image it really brings out that fine detail but doesn't add noise or grain to the sky because we masked it out now this is shot at 100 ISO so noise reduction is not something generally going to need to do uh, I'll bring it up just a little bit and then there's an automatic color and noise default now effects this is something I generally do last but I do like for preparing a print to add a little bit of post crop vignetting. Very subtle amount. I want to darken the edges just a smidge. And I find myself going usually minus seven or minus eight. And if I go there, it's a very subtle bit of vignetting. In fact, if you stare at the image right now, you really can barely see it. However, if I turn it on and off, then you get to see. And what it has the effect of doing is kind of refocusing you into the middle of the image so that you have uh, kind of your eye is more directed. The, the darkness on the edges keeps you in the image. This image looks pretty well ready to go out to print. And let's just do a one last check before and after. I'll hit shift tab to hide the side menus and I'll hit the Y key to show before and after where we started and where we ended. And then the L key a couple of times to go to dark and we get to see the before on the left and our after on the right and much better ready for printing. Here's one more image that needs a little bit of editing, except I'm going to blow through this one a little faster. You can uh, review at your leisure, but I wanted to show you a before and after on some other sliders here. So let's get started. So again, we look at the histogram. Great. We've got great exposure, really taking advantage of the entire tonal range of the camera. However, disappointing because the highlights needed to be saved and it made the shadows and some of the colors muted. So we need to open that up. So again, exposure's fine. Contrast is fine for now. In this case, I want to bring the highlights down. I want to kind of take away a little bit of this brightness here, and I'm going to counter that by opening the shadows way up. Because this is how my eyes saw it, and the camera, remember, the camera doesn't have the same tonal or contrast range that your eyes do. Now it's making it look a lot flatter, but that's okay, because that's what we're after. We're going to bring, again, our friend the clarity slider way up to really open up the details to make it start to look the way our eyes saw it. Vibrance again will affect the blues and the greens and more subtle colors. Saturation will increase everything. Already the image is looking a heck of a lot better. I can see I've got some spots. So let's go ahead and get rid of those real quick. and get the spot editing tool. Give myself a little bit bigger brush here. And I'll get that one and that one. One more little one here. Let's get rid of that. Okay, looks like our, oh, I got one more up in here, spots. 
Okay, spots are gone. Okay, so we've gone through our basics and already, let me just hit done on our spot tool. And that quickly, let's look at our before and after. Look where we've come so far. Great. So let's add a little bit more to this. Now I want to open up the face of this arch because again, to my eyes, it was much brighter. So I'm going to go right into the paintbrush, the adjustment brush. I'm going to hit O to turn on my mask and I'm going to paint on the face of the arch. And again, I have auto mask on, so see it goes right to the edge of the arch without touching the sky beyond. So I'm going to hit O to turn that off, and I'm going to open up the arch. And here I am going to use the exposure slider just to add some more light into that. I'm going to increase the, increase the clarity. I'm going to open up the shadows a little more. And great, that's more what it looked like to my eye. Lastly, again, this orange here was supernaturally glowing. So I'm going to add a new paintbrush adjustment. Hit O to toggle on my brush again. And now I'm just going to fly by on this orange. You see how quick this is to do? I'm actually doing this with a trackpad. I even have my mouse next to me. I'm not even using that. So it's really automatic and really easy to do. Hit O to toggle that off. I'm going to bring that saturation way up of my orange. I'm going to increase the exposure on it a little bit. And there we go. That's what it looked like. Maybe even add a little contrast, a little extra clarity. It's kind of like a cooking show here. All right, very good. Now, before I continue, I am going to do my crop because I want to be able to focus in on the image. So I hit the R key. I'm not going to concern myself with a preset. I'm going to crop this to how I feel the image needs it. I'm up. I'm going to take away a little bit of the sky. Now, Technically, if you go by, if you're stuck on the rule of thirds, and the rule of thirds is a good starting point, but again, remember, it's not a rule, it's a guideline. In this case, I've got that, hori that far horizon kind of dead center in the image. However, it's not really the horizon of, them as, of this image. Yes, it's a horizon, but we kind of interpret the horizon here as being the arch. So the arch really is kind of across our top third line, so we're going to leave that there. So I hit enter, and wow, we're almost done. The other last thing I want to do is I want to bring back, take away a little of the haze that we're seeing off in the deep valley here. So again, I'm going to get the brush, turn on O so I can see my overlay, and I'm going to paint off in the distant valley. Now, if it picks up areas that you did not want, I picked up some of this foreground here, and I want to get rid of that. So if you hold down the Option or Alt key, it turns into a minus, and then I could subtract out some of that that I didn't want. But the rest of that I kind of do. All right, O to toggle that off. And what I want to really do is increase the clarity a lot. And I'm going to increase the contrast. And I'm actually going to bring the exposure and the highlights down. I'm going to take away a little bit of the haze. Not all of it. I'm going to leave a little bit of it there. All right, so done with that. Lastly, let's go ahead and do our sharpening. So I'm going to add my midpoint sharpening. I'm going to leave the radius at 1 for this one. I'm going to go ahead and choose my sharpening point so I can see what's going on right here in this intersection on the side of the arch. And I'm going to hold down Alt or Option while dragging the masking slider. Everything turns white. I drag it to the right. And again, remember, just the areas that are in white actually get the sharpening. Just the edges. Great. And done. How fast was that? Let me turn that on and off. And what a great image. And if we hit the Y key, we can see the before and after, where we started, where we finished. And now we've got an image that's ready for printing. So you can see why Lightroom was one of my favorite programs. Does it eliminate the need for Photoshop? No. There's still a lot of things you need to do if you want to do Photoshop. Anything that's going to involve serious masking, serious pixel-based editing, I'm still going to go into Photoshop. In fact, for my final print, I actually ended up creating a uh, sort of a poster print of that picture of Mesa Arch, which you're going to see in a couple minutes. Uh, and to do that, I went into Photoshop, and you'll see the results in a second. Uh, someone asked, do I ever shoot RAW and JPEG to compare the two after adjustments? It's a good question. Sometimes you, you might really like the way a JPEG comes out in the camera because the camera's processing it. The downside is, though, with only 8 bits of data, you're very limited to what you can do. It's going to depend on the scene. If you have a well-lit afternoon, then your JPEG might be really good. 
But when you get into a scene that has a very high contrast range, very high tonal range, and maybe it's got different color temperatures, uh, maybe you've got something in shade near your feet and then you have a bright sky, when you start to do edits on images like that as a JPEG, they start to fall apart very quickly, particularly if you have a bright blue sky uh, that does not have a lot of clouds in it, you're gonna get banding very quickly. So I really don't experiment with JPEGs very much anymore. Uh, someone asked, do I use both vibrance and saturation regularly because they impact different colors? And the answer is yes. I will use vibrance if I have an image that's got a lot of blues and greens in it and I want to add a little pop. Saturation, I'll add as well, but a little bit less. Uh, typically, it depends on the camera. I found uh, I used to shoot Canons. I was typically 17 to 20 points. I generally find on my Sony I'm closer to 10 to 12 points on saturation. Uh, here's a good question. Someone said they just did several Santa shoots for charity. Uh, used the color checker to calibrate, but all the reds, particularly Santa's suit, were seriously out of gamut according to Lightroom 5 soft proofing. Uh, when they use the color adjustments to bring the red into gamut, it also changes the skin tones, making the skin tones look horrible. Good point, and really the answer is don't even try. Don't even try to bring those reds back into gamut. When you do a soft proofing, your monitor is showing you what the red's going to look like. The problem is we've got these reds that are out of gamut, just like you saw in some of the edits and you're going to see again. There's nothing you can do to make the printer print it, but if you're working on a MacBook or an Apple display or just a standard display that's only an sRGB display, your display can't show you those colors anyway. Your printer may still be able to print some of them, but you're getting these gamut warnings. So really the answer is, for those heavily out of gamut colors, my recommendation is leave them alone. Uh, you just want to adjust the rest of the image that's in gamut. And that was a perfect lead-in, didn't even plan on it, because now that the editing process is complete for our image, it's time to create our print. This step has caused so many headaches for a lot of you. It used to for me as well. It really should be an easier process. As this, uh, this uh, viewer mentioned, Lightroom 5 now has the ability to do something called a soft proof. And what a soft proof does, it allows you to see your, how your image will print before you actually send it to the printer and waste paper and ink because it didn't come out right. Now, for this process to be accurate and repeatable, you need two things, a monitor that is calibrated and a good paper profile. With these two pieces in place, then you can get consistently beautiful prints. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm a big fan. No, that doesn't even do it justice. I love Ilford's Gold Cotton Textured Paper. And again, I've got my big box of it here, and for those times I do need a glossier surface, I've got gold fiber silk, my favorite non-fine art paper. The reason I like that paper is because even though it has that matte fine art surface, it does produce a color and tonal range that comes close to glossy and luster stocks. In fact, let's take a look here. You can see the box is closer. Besides the beautiful texture and the color reproduction, the surface of these papers makes framing behind glass easier because you don't get any glare. Now, there are some times when a glossier surface is more appropriate for an image. Product photography, architectural images, sometimes when I do portraits, then I like to use the uh, gold fiber silk. It's a, it's a luster surface. It has a surface that feels, uh, it's kind of indistinguishable from a conventional fiber-based luster photo print. It's kind of you'd get back from a lab. Now, the paper surface you choose can have a big impact on the feel of your image. So I'd recommend trying a few out and find your favorite papers. So let's go into Lightroom one more time. We're going to go through the soft proofing process, and then we're going to make our print. Well, we've got our image all edited and ready to go. It looks beautiful. Now it is time to go ahead and print. And the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and soft proof. And to do that, I click on this box in the develop module called soft proofing. And you can see some changes happen up on the top here. Uh, we've got some different options. We've got create proof copy. We've got which profiles being used, etc. We also have some new options in the actual histogram. And if you take a look where the black clipping used to be, it now has something called the monitor gamut warning. And what this is telling us is these dark blue areas are places where the monitor cannot actually show that color correctly. This is color that's actually beyond the monitor's capabilities. Nothing we can really do about that. Just kind of let it go. Because the printer can print it. The printer has a wider gamut than this, this monitor does. 
Now up in the right hand corner we've got the paper gamut warning. And you can see all our beautiful bright orange here, it's showing that that particular orange is out of gamut for this particular paper profile. And I've got here uh, Gallery Prestige Gold Cotton Textured from Ilford printing on my Canon 6350 printer. Now this is something that's going to be peculiar to each paper. If I go to a glossy stock, here's super high gloss, if I go to there, this printer has a wider gamut. You can see there's much less red there. Now, we can't make colors print that are beyond the printer's gamut. But what we are seeing in our proof, since we are in a soft proofing mode, we are seeing the effect the paper has on the particular color. So the oranges that you see there are what you're going to get. Now, I really do want to go out to my fine art paper. So I'm going to dial back in my gold cotton textured paper. I see I get a little deeper there. And again, if I turn that on, it's telling me, yes, that orange is going to move, but it's going to move as we see it right here on the screen. Now, based on that, I can make some decisions. Do I need to make adjustments? Do I want to boost maybe the contrast a little bit to make up for the slight loss of saturation? In fact, I think I will do that. So I'm going to go in here and boost up the contrast just a little bit more. Since this is a fine art paper, it's a matte paper, uh, it'll give us a little bit more density. So what I'm going to do is create a proof copy that we can then go ahead and make changes that are particular just to what we're doing here. So I add a little bit of contrast. And we can also check the different rendering intents. And notice in Lightroom we just got two. We've got perceptual and relative. And unfortunately these descriptions aren't particularly helpful because you might find that some printer paper combinations work better with perceptual or relative regardless of these notes here. So we've seen perceptual. Let's click on relative and see what happens. One more time, go back to perceptual. And if we take a look at relative, relative seems to maintain a little bit more density uh, on that orange. So for this particular print, I'm going to go relative. So I think that's pretty good. I know we're soft proofing. We're seeing this through the color paper profile that we've created. So let's just go ahead and print. So I click on print. I had created a custom paper size. Uh, this is 24 inches by 14 inches. Okay, so I've got it rotated to fit. We've got my layout. There's a default setting here for margins. You really can't make them any smaller than they're set. Uh, I did maximize the cell size. If you wanted, you could have the image appear smaller on the paper uh, by determining a height. So if you wanted to print something like this and have the paper form a mat, you have that option. We're just going to skip down to the important part, and that's the actual print job. So we're sending the job to the printer. Print resolution. 240 is the default for most inkjets, uh, so I'm just going to leave that there. I am going to go to 16-bit output. So for our color management, we've got our paper chosen, the gold cotton textured, but we decided through our soft proofing that we preferred relative. Now, if for some reason your profile is not behaving, uh, maybe you're, you keep printing, your print keeps coming out too dark. Well, you can override your profile and go into print adjustment and increase the brightness and contrast. I recommend not doing that first. You want to leave it alone. Hopefully you have a good profile and that's not going to be an issue. So we've got our printer profile or our paper profile dialed in. We've chose relative because that's what we liked. 16-bit output because the printer supports it. Before we click on print, let's check printer. And we want to dial in the printer we're going to be using. So it's going to be our Canon 6350. Let's go through the main settings. We've got plain paper. We're actually printing on art paper, and it's considered a fine art textured paper. Under our page setup, I've got 24-inch roll paper. I can tell it no space at top or bottom. That'll keep it from wasting paper. So we've got our roll paper chosen. We've told it that it is fine art textured paper. We're printing our image at high quality. We can click on high precision for photographs and then go to 16-bit. So it tells you the certain options not available 16-bit, that's fine. Now it is ready to print. And actually, before we do this, I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'm going to save these current settings. Gold cotton textured, just for this printer. Hit OK, and go ahead and click Print. And a beautiful thing that will happen is, I'm going to get a print that looks like we see on the screen right here. And here are the results. I actually printed these yesterday on my Canon 6350. I love them. Before I started using these papers, I actually had most of my prints done at a lab. 
I've gotten back into doing my own printing because of this paper. You just can't get this feel and tonality from conventional prints. Really, they just make me happy. In fact, Rick, go ahead and, and zoom in on the main print. And I had mentioned I had gone into Photoshop, and I did that for the, the layout and to add the text to kind of create this poster look. And this entire grouping is actually going to end up in my uh, living room. I'm going to replace one of the other prints that's there. Now, a couple more questions. We're just about out of time. Uh, someone asked, am I ever concerned about the color transition in print when I'm pushing the saturation and exposure? The answer is yes. That's something you have to be very careful of particularly when you have a solid blue sky that isn't broken with clouds. You can see it. If you push it up too much, you'll actually start seeing the banding creep in in your preview in Lightroom. When that starts to happen, you got to back off. Now, I have found other softwares, other plugins that will do a better job for that. And if that's the case, what I'll often do is I'll jump into, say, Nick Viveza uh, or one of the, the new On One software to bring up the saturation or density of those solid blue skies. Because when you start to do it in Lightroom, it does start to break up. Uh, someone asked, in my opinion, do today's 16 megapixel APS-C sensors have enough resolution or juice, as they use the word, for prints up to 16 by 20 or larger? And the answer is absolutely. You'd be amazed at how little resolution you actually need for a print. Understand your eyes can only see about 180 lines. That's all you can see. And if you send over 300 DPI to a printer, it's actually really a waste of time. When you're printing on, five, on a fine art paper, if you have 180 DPI at your final size, you're, that's plenty. Uh, it all depends on how much fine detail there is, but 180 is perfect, and I would defy you to be able to see the difference between an image like this printed at 180 DPI versus one at 300. Uh, someone asked, will printing on canvas give a different color than from paper? Not if you have a good profile for the canvas. Canvas is just like paper. It's just got a different coating. It's got a coating with a different texture on it. If you have a good profile, that'll fix for that. And then lastly, some, uh, somebody asked for all the adjustments I just did in Lightroom. Is there an advantage of using layers in Photoshop? There are. Photoshop will allow you to take things to another level. And I often will go into Photoshop when I need to do that. The difference between Photoshop and Lightroom is the layers and the masking abilities. And you kind of set me up for that because the next program that we're going to do for Ilford and X-Rite is going to be everything we did today but using Photoshop. Oh, lastly, someone asked, what's the difference between Adobe Camera Raw and Lightroom? They're actually the same thing. Uh, Lightroom adds a lot of functionality. Lightroom adds uh, the map, the book, uh, modules, the slideshows. Uh, printing up in batches, uh, it does all of that, it's got a different interface, and it's an image database. But the controls in it, all the stuff that I just did in Lightroom, is exactly the same in Adobe Camera Raw. The difference is when you do it in Lightroom, and you can continue to do all your edits and make different copies of them, nothing actually gets applied to the raw file until you export the file somewhere else. In Adobe Camera Raw, as soon as you open that file in Photoshop, it's no longer a raw file, it has those changes built into the file. So that's really the biggest difference. We're out of time. There's a lot more to the editing process that even Lightroom can do, and particularly the image organization that we could cover, but it was more than we could cover in the time today. If you're interested in a more comprehensive set of tutorials, send me a note, send me an email, and I'll send you, I'll send you some links that might interest you. So let's sum up real quick before we have to leave. One, before you do anything, get that monitor calibrated. That's where you're making all your editing decisions. It has to be correct. Two, get a custom camera profile for the light in the scene. That's going to give you a perfect starting point for you to make your edits. Make your edits to enhance and shape the image. Remember, your job is not to just take a photograph. It's to make a photograph. And shaping that light is what's going to create a great image. Find a paper that excites you. Find a couple of papers that excite you. And then you can make great prints that you can then share with others. And because of our sponsors, we're able to do this. Thank you both to Ilford and x -Rite. Thank you guys for watching. We've had a great year. We really look forward to 2014. So until then, from our entire crew, from Jen, from Rick, be well, have a safe and happy new year, and we'll see you next year. Bye-bye.